today we're going to be taking a look at heart failure as part of the cardiology series. To start this topic, we first have to recap the normal cardiac function, and we're going to be doing this by using a simplified diagram which is shown here. If you remember, the right side of the heart pumps deoxygenated blood to the lungs, and then oxygenated blood returns to the left side, where it's pumped to the rest of the body via the aorta. You can see that this forms a double circulation system. We also have valves between different parts of the heart, so for example, the atrioventricular valves and the semilunar valves, which help to control the flow of blood. When it comes to the contraction of the heart, this is termed as ventricular systole, and what happens in this phase is the ventricles begin to contract together, and this increases the ventricular pressure enough to open the semilunar valves. After this point, the contraction continues, and the blood is ejected into the pulmonary artery and aorta respectively. Following this, we have a diastolic phase, which is also known as the relaxation phase of the heart. In this step, new blood enters the atria, and the atrioventricular valves open as a result of this. The blood then moves both passively and actively into the ventricles, filling them again. You can see that this forms a cycle, and we now return to the start of ventricular systole, and from this point the entire process repeats again. Now, one thing you may have noticed is that during ventricular systole, when the blood is ejected from the heart, a small volume of blood actually remains in the ventricles, and this is referred to as the end systolic volume, while the amount that was ejected is referred to as the stroke volume. If we add both of these values together, we get what's called the end diastolic volume, which is basically the total volume of blood in the ventricles before ejection. Just to put all of these definitions in one place, we can say that the end diastolic volume therefore equals the stroke volume plus the end systolic volume. And the reason why these values are so important is because they can help us calculate some other markers of cardiac function. For example, we could work out the ejection fraction, which is calculated by dividing the stroke volume from the end diastolic volume, and this gives us an indication of the percentage of blood leaving the left ventricle at each beat. It therefore works out how efficiently the left ventricle is pumping, and the normal value for this ejection fraction is usually about 55 to 70 percent. As well as this, the stroke volume can be multiplied by the heart rate to work out the cardiac output, and this gives a representation of the volume of blood pumped by the ventricles in one minute. The value for this is usually around 4 to 8 liters per minute at rest, but it can increase during activity. Now that we understand the fundamentals behind cardiac function, we can turn towards the concept of heart failure. And this is a condition where the heart is unable to provide adequate cardiac output to meet the body's perfusion demands. And there are two types of heart failure. The first is referred to as heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, which is characterized by a reduced pumping ability. And the second type is called heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. And this is represented by impaired filling ability. Let's start by taking a look at heart failure with reduced ejection fraction in more detail. In this condition, diastole occurs as normal, so there's full ventricular filling, and there's a normal end diastolic volume. However, a problem arises during the ventricular systole phase of the cardiac cycle. So when the ventricles contract, there's actually poor ejection of blood into the arteries and this results in a reduced stroke volume. In this case, you can see that the left ventricle has more blood at the end of systole compared to the right side. If we turn back to our equation, we can see that the stroke volume in this case has decreased because there's less blood being ejected, and the end diastolic volume has remained the same because diastole is unimpaired. Based on this, we can see that the ejection fraction therefore decreases and this is why it's referred to as a heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. To be precise with our definition, this usually occurs when the left ventricular ejection fraction falls below 40%, and there can be several causes behind this. For example, in cases of myocardial infarction or ischemic heart disease, if there's an area of infarction, it can impair the pumping of the ventricle on that side. Alternatively, if a patient has hypertension, it's much harder for the ventricles to pump against a higher blood pressure, and this can result in impaired ejection. The same also occurs in valvular pathology, 
So for example, in cases of aortic stenosis, it's much harder for the left ventricle to pump against the stenotic valve, and this results in poorer ejection fraction. This can also occur in mitral regurgitation, where there's backflow of blood from the left ventricle into the left atrium, again reducing the stroke volume. Finally, some patients may have structural abnormalities, so for example, dilated cardiomyopathy, and in this condition, the ventricles become larger and thinner, and these thin walls result in impaired pumping ability. Let's now take a look at the second type of heart failure, which is a heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. In this instance, the diastolic phase of the cardiac cycle is impaired, and we end up with less blood in the ventricles at the end of diastole, or a reduced end diastolic volume. In comparison, the process of ventricular systole, so the contraction phase, actually occurs as normal, so the blood is ejected into the corresponding arteries from the ventricles. However, because the left ventricle had less blood at the start of systole, we still end up with a reduced stroke volume, and that's because this volume of blood here, which is in the atrium, should have also been ejected, but it wasn't because it didn't move into the ventricles. If we compare this with our equation, we can see that the end diastolic volume has gone down because diastole is impaired, and the stroke volume has also subsequently decreased. These two changes counteract each other, and we end up with a preserved ejection fraction. And we can define this as a heart failure where the left ventricular ejection fraction remains above 50%, but the cardiac output remains low. Again, there could be a range of different causes behind this. So for example, there could be myocardial ischemia or hypertension. There could also be arrhythmia such as atrial fibrillation, where the ventricles are unable to fill properly due to the irregularity of the heartbeat. In some patients, there might also be concentric cardiomyopathy, which is a structural change where the ventricles become smaller and also less wide. And this is often as a result of thicker ventricular walls. You can see that these structural changes lead to less space for the blood to be held, and therefore we get a reduced cardiac output because only a small volume of blood will enter the ventricles during diastole. In terms of the signs and symptoms of heart failure, there's often an overlap between reduced ejection fraction and preserved ejection fraction cases, and it kind of depends on which side of the heart is affected first. For example, in cases of left-sided heart failure, there's ventricular overload on the left ventricle over time, and this feeds back into the left atrium and eventually back into the pulmonary system as well. This subsequently leads to respiratory symptoms because all of the fluid backs up into the lungs and causes congestion. On the other hand, if the right side of the heart is affected first, we end up with overload on the right side and this feeds back to the rest of the body, eventually leading to peripheral congestion and edema. Because the heart has a closed system, in most patients is actually a mix of both right-sided and left-sided heart failure signs. So this leads to a mixture of both pulmonary and peripheral symptoms. For example, there might be shortness of breath and bibasal crackles because of fluid buildup in the lungs, accompanied with dry cough and occasional chest pain. Some patients may also experience dizziness and syncopal episodes due to the poor cardiac output. In terms of peripheral symptoms, there might be peripheral edema or peripheral leg swelling, as well as jugular venous distension or a raised JVP. In some cases, there might be extra third and fourth heart sounds heard on auscultation due to the overload on the heart. Moving towards the diagnosis of heart failure, we usually start off with routine investigations such as bloods, an electrocardiogram, and a chest x-ray for all patients who are suspected to have the condition. One blood test in particular is called the NT pro BNP level, and BNP is this hormone which is released in response to ventricular overload. So whenever there's volume overload, the ventricles respond by secreting BNP into the blood. The purpose of this BNP is that it helps to increase sodium and water excretion, and therefore reduces the overload burden on the heart. Therefore, although the BNP can actually be thought of as cardioprotective, we can still use it as a marker, and the more BNP we have, the more likely it is that there's some level of overload. To be specific, if the BNP value is above 400 nanograms per liter, we should refer to cardiology and perform an echo. 
and if it's less than 400 nanograms per liter, we should consider alternative diagnoses instead. If the echo returns positive for heart failure, we can confirm the diagnosis, and if it's negative, we can consider alternatives again. To summarize this, we can see that the BNP level can help to stratify patients, but the echocardiogram is ultimately what leads to the diagnosis, and an echo can help to distinguish between both a heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction and a heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. In terms of the management options for heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, we can start with medical management using medications such as ACE inhibitors, which help to inhibit the RAS pathway and reduce blood pressure, and beta blockers, which can reduce the myocardial oxygen demand and prevent cardiac remodeling. Following this, we can consider mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists such as aplerinone and spironolactone, which are potassium-sparing diuretics that can help to reduce fluid overload. If these options fail, we can turn towards more specialist medications, which are routinely started by a cardiologist. Just to take a look at one of these medications in more detail, sacubitril and valsartan is becoming an increasingly popular option, and the way that it works is by capitalizing on the cardioprotective effects of BNP. If you remember, BNP helps to drive sodium and water excretion, as well as driving vasodilation, and these effects can help to reduce the level of overload. Now the problem is that we have this enzyme called neprilysin, which usually breaks down BNP. So the enzyme basically breaks down these molecules, and as a consequence, we lose the cardioprotective effects. The solution to this is using a neprilysin inhibitor, such as sacubitril, and by blocking the neprilysin enzyme, we can result in more BNP being formed, and therefore more cardioprotection. Now, unfortunately, things are never really that simple in medicine, and neprilysin actually breaks down a different substance called angiotensin II, which you might know from the RAS pathway, and this usually increases vasoconstriction and aldosterone. If we therefore block neprilysin with sacubitril, we end up with a buildup of angiotensin II, and therefore more aldosterone and more vasoconstriction, and these effects work to increase the overload on the heart. To solve this issue, we often combine sacubitril with valsartan, which is an angiotensin receptor blocker, and this helps to reduce the negative effects of angiotensin II while retaining the positive effects of a high BNP. Now, aside from sacubitril and valsartan, you can see that we have a range of different other specialist medications, and they all have their own mechanisms of action, but we'll probably go through these in a separate video. It's also worth mentioning that some patients with heart failure and a reduced ejection fraction are offered procedure-based interventions. So for example, cardiac resynchronization therapy, which involves a biventricular pacemaker that helps to synchronize the contraction of the ventricles. Some patients might also be offered a left ventricular assist device, or an LVAD, which is basically this mechanical pump that helps to improve left ventricular function. Finally, in a select group of patients with end-stage heart failure, we might consider a heart transplant, which is where the impaired heart is replaced by a new donor heart instead. To finish off, we have a summary slide here which outlines the key points from this session. I hope you find this video helpful, and I'll see you in the next one.